Hey, everybody. It is Thursday, October 19th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Shwununu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Jill, if it sounds like I'm an NPR anchor right now, it's because baby Olivia is in a really good nap right now, about five feet away. And uh, I'm trying to keep her there while also recording this pod. And by NPR, you mean talking low, right? Talking low <laughs> and passionate about what's happening in the world. Well, I'm kind of with you because my voice is still recovering. So I'm also going to be NPRing it right now. <laughs> or <laughs> so a bit had, of a different style for us today. If we had a British accent, we'd be like the BBC <laughs> and everything would sound like a question and be inquisitive uh, for those of you. <laughs> <laughs> who are familiar, various uh, media organizations. Uh, some literally have a style of um, of speaking. They put you through um, coaches. Um, and so uh, some have very distinct ones. Even specific shows at different networks have their own sound. Right. Like, for example, if any of you watch ABC World News tonight, uh, everything is tonight, urgent, breaking. There are no... <laughs> Most things are not said in complete sentences because that doesn't feel urgent enough. So next time you watch ABC World News Tonight, um, notice the anchor David Muir. He'll uh, always bring on the reporter afterwards, take a bit of their reporting, and the reporter will then respond. That's right, David. If once you know this, it will drive you nuts because it literally happens in every single story. I am definitely going to be watching <laughs> tonight uh, to just check it out. Okay, Mosh, but let's get to some headlines here. President Biden visits Israel, showing support after the terror attack on October 7th. He also announced a deal to bring aid to Gaza. Plus, more evidence seems to prove that that hospital explosion in Gaza was not from Israel. But now that the story is out, does it matter when it comes to public opinion, particularly in the Arab world? Does the truth really matter anymore, Jill? We're in a post-truth world. Back to U.S. politics. Will the third time be the charm for Jim Jordan? He lost the second round of voting for House Speaker. What's next? All right, a story that has literally been years in the making. Yaron Vandersloot admits to killing Alabama teen Natalie Holloway. That name might be familiar to some of you, Jill. You and I both covered this uh, yesteryear, many, many journalism jobs ago back there in the, in the mid-aughts. One of my first journalism jobs, actually, and I think for you as well. Uh, Mosh, we've also been on Recession Watch for over a year already. There is some new data, though, that shows Americans' net worth surged during the pandemic by the most in decades. The future is here. Amazon starts delivering medications by drone. We'll tell you where. A new way to board an airplane. How United is mixing things up. The system is called Wilma. We'll tell you about it. <laughs> Wilma. I can't. I can't even do it with my voice. <laughs> okay, Mosh, you wanted cheery on yesterday's pod. Yes. Are you are you ready to talk about the holiday season? I can't wait. <laughs> Martha Stewart is teaming up with Etsy on a holiday collection. And as always, Mosh, you'll have on this day in history. Um, Jill, if you thought politics is bad now, uh, on this day in history, one of the nastiest things in American political history uh, went down, and the year was 1796. I cannot wait, because maybe it'll make us feel better about the time that we're living in. As Mark Twain once said, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes, Jill. <laughs> okay, let's start in the Middle East. President Biden wrapping up a seven and a half hour visit to Israel on Wednesday he reiterated his support and solidarity with Israel after that Hamas terror attack on October 7th. The trip complicated by the Gaza hospital explosion. Evidence from Israel and third parties back up Israel's claim that it was actually a rocket from Islamic Jihad that misfired and hit the hospital parking lot. Biden also backing up that claim on Wednesday, and he said it is based on information that he got from the Pentagon. The National Security Council saying based on analysis of overhead imagery, intercepts, and open source information, they have determined that Israel was not responsible. Moshe, we'll talk a bit more about that later in the podcast. Back to Biden, he met with Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and also families of those that were killed in the terrorist attack. But he did warn Israel not to let their rage over the attacks consume them. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. 
While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. Biden saying the vast majority of Palestinians are not Hamas. During his visit, he reached a deal with Israelis to get limited humanitarian aid into Gaza from Egypt. He also announced $100 million in aid to Gaza and the West Bank. Now, he didn't get to meet face to face with the leaders of Egypt and Jordan because, as we mentioned yesterday, Jordan's King Abdullah canceled that summit that was planned after the hospital explosion Jordan still blaming it on Israel. But Biden did reportedly talk to Egypt's leader, al-Sisi, from Egypt for more than an hour while he was on the tarmac in Air Force One. They reached a deal to let 20 trucks of aid go through the Rafah crossing. According to CBS News's Weijia Zhang, the president saying that if Hamas confiscates the aid, then the flow will end. He was also asked if he was disappointed that the Arab leaders meeting in Jordan was canceled. And he said no, because ultimately he was able to reach a deal with CC to open the humanitarian corridor. Despite what he's saying there, Jill, uh, it's hard to think that he isn't just a bit disappointed. This is not the trip that he planned to go on even 24 hours previous. You know, the plan was to meet the Jordanians, meet with the Palestinians, um, uh, do much more than he was able to do. But of course, with the explosion at the hospital and then what unfolded over the last day, um, He had a more limited scope of what he was trying to do. He's trying to walk a fine diplomatic line here of continuing to support Israel as it fights back against the terrorist attack by Hamas, uh, but at the same time show that the U.S. is supporting uh, the humanitarian concerns of the Palestinians. Uh, He did note, as Biden is apt to do, that he's met every Israeli prime minister going back five decades, starting with Golda Meir back in the early 70s. That was another time the U.S. was trying to prevent a war from spreading more widely and from escalating. Uh, And this time around, he's trying to do the same thing. In particular, the focus is Iran, trying to ensure that Iran does not escalate things beyond the Hamas-Israel conflict, despite the fact that you're hearing threats by the Iranians now uh, several times a day. As far as the hospital explosion is concerned, we posted a thread of the evidence released on Wednesday over on our Instagram account. And while the evidence does show that it was not Israel that caused the hospital explosion, and that's the evidence Israel has presented, that's the American evidence, that's uh, military nonprofits from around the world, some with you know basically no dog in the fight here, but the evidence is pretty clear Um, that it appears to have been an Islamic Jihad rocket that misfired um, into the hospital parking lot. So there's a lot of questions being asked about how quickly the media went with the Hamas storyline. They had put out just within minutes of the explosion that 500 people were dead, the hospital was destroyed, and it was the Israelis. Um, More than 24 hours post-explosion, Hamas has not released evidence to back up any of those allegations. But the Israelis have um, released a a whole bunch of evidence that includes audio of uh, Hamas admitting it was Islamic Jihad in a phone call, um, radar imagery, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of videos that back up um, their argument. Again, that's backed up by third parties. That said, um, given how quickly things escalated over the last 24 hours, the Arab street, as it's called, is not buying it. Tens of thousands of Arabs uh, have hit the street in protest, some violent across the region. Uh, that in- that stretches in the Palestinian West Bank, that stretches to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, to Tunisia. That's where protesters reportedly burned down one of the few synagogues left in the country. Tunisia once had a large Jewish community. Now it is very, very small, uh, but a synagogue was burned down. Um, In Lebanon, the U.S. embassy was attacked um, in Beirut, uh, and a U.S. consulate was attacked in Turkey, which has been now shut down indefinitely. So the U.S. also getting blamed here for its support of Israel. So for many people... The feeling was they saw that a Hamas storyline, it hit social media, uh, it very much upset people, and that rage continued. Uh, We did hear, um, Jill, from a a close friend um, who's uh, well-connected within Lebanon, who said it actually could have been much worse, that actually, while most people want to continue to blame Israel there, the evidence against Islamic Jihad, pretty comprehensive, and it has toned things down in the country. On that note, Moshe, as we talked about yesterday, everyone tends to believe their own narrative here. And part of what we try to do at Mo News is to really verify sources and facts. Can you talk a little bit about what went so wrong here? Because the ramifications are huge. Yeah, I mean, we this is one of the few wars we've had in the full on global social media era. You know, that's really 10 years old. So beyond Ukraine, Russia, this is probably the most significant conflict that's being fought not only on the ground, but on Twitter, 
aka X, uh, Facebook, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, and when things happen, um, actually getting clarity and facts takes time, it turns out. And that time sometimes just takes a couple of hours. But in that time, that's where that vacuum is filled by misinformation, opinions, um, and you know, as we discovered, fake accounts, fake videos, antiquated videos, um, and look what happened. Right um, now, I think media organizations. This is a discussion we've been having over on the Mo News Premium Instagram thread. Have um, you know a challenge here because they want to be able to report things quickly, um, and media tends to cite. Right, police say X. The U.S. says Y. The Pentagon says X. The Israelis say Y. In this case, um, one of the sources you're dealing with um, is a military on one side and the IDF, right? On the other side, the Hamas terrorist group, which throws stuff out there. And I think a lot of organizations said, well, Hamas claims 500 are dead and this was an Israeli missile strike. And to a certain extent, it reinforced a narrative. I they didn't even say Hamas said. They said Palestinian officials said. Exactly. But in Gaza, Hamas is the government, right? Yep. The same terrorist group that like burned down homes, tortured people, has taken 200 hostages, is the health ministry in the Gaza Strip. They put out the um, numbers of the number of people dead and what's going on there. So they have an agenda. All governments have agenda. But, you know, we don't equate all governments equally. You're going to take the French government more seriously than you're going to take the Taliban, right? You're going to take the U.S. government more seriously than you're going to take... Um, Iran or North Korea. And, you know, if you look at the evidence, you can take the Israeli government and how it conducts itself more seriously than Hamas. Not all things are equal here. Let's be very clear about it. At the same time, the Israelis have their own agenda. And so they need to be questioned as we critically question all governments. We can question the Israeli government. Uh, but I think that media organizations, when reporting this sort of thing that has such an impact, need to be very clear. Listen, this is information we're getting from Hamas. We have not verified this information ourselves. I mean, look, once daytime pictures came out, they hit the parking lot of the hospital. Now people were out there and people died and it's a tragedy, but you know, Hamas's initial report was the entire hospital was leveled. That was clearly not the case. So if media organizations are going to report what governments or terror groups or whomever is telling them, I think they just have to be very clear of like, this is who we're getting it from. This is whether we can confirm it um, and, uh, you know, and just be transparent about the information as opposed to, I think our tendency sometimes is to report things as absolute fact, to give people certainty. And if anything is certain about the Middle East, it's that things are uncertain. And it is really dangerous to, to get that kind of misinformation out there, especially in the social media age. Ian Bremer, who you have interviewed for this podcast before, a foreign policy expert, he tweeted or wrote on X, Absent facts, the guilty party is the one that you don't like. This problem <laughs> amplified massively by social media is destroying democracy. And he actually was showing, you know, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. She is a Palestinian American. She wrote, Israel just bombed the Baptist hospital, killing 500 Palestinians, doctors, children, patients, just like that. And never corrected it, didn't take it down. Yeah, she's a sitting member of Congress, but by the way, not the only public official uh, who tends to tweet things out without facts. I mean, we just had a president who did that for about four years, Jill. Also a very good point, Mosh. <laughs> <laughs> we live in the post-truth era, people have referred to it. Um, and I think that, you know, our um, caution to everyone is like, take a beat here. And by the way, we're still waiting for Hamas to make their case. They claim that after the Israelis have laid out their case and all the evidence that they too will show the evidence that this was the Israeli strike. Now, Hamas is there. They've been at the hospital for 24 hours. We have not seen their case or their evidence. So, you know, we remain open-minded with uh, several grains of salt there. But I, th I think that one thing people should just keep in mind here as this war continues is as hard as it is, you know, um, try to uh, take a pause here. And I think, you know, I, I think ultimately for many people, the Ian Bremmer's point, you're going to believe something that reinforces your own narrative. It's very hard to pop that bubble uh, on an issue that is so passionate, so divisive. And want to quickly mention that President Biden is planning a primetime address tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, just an update, we believe, on what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to um, his remarks there. Jill, by the time that address happens, a lot will unfold. It is incredible because as we were putting this podcast together, there have been like 15 new headlines since the Gaza explosion yesterday. That's how quickly this is moving. Yeah. 
the fog of war, Jill. And with that, let's get to some U.S. politics. Will the third time be the charm for Jim Jordan in a second round of voting on Wednesday? Republican Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio once again not getting enough votes to become House Speaker. He had 199 Republicans vote for him in this vote. He had 200 the first time around which means the momentum is going in the wrong direction. The magic number, 217. Democrats all voted for Hakeem Jeffries. That gave him 212 votes. Seven of the Republicans who didn't vote for Jim Jordan went for Steve Scalise. Five voted for former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. There was one vote for former Speaker John Boehner to thunderous applause on the House floor. Remember, Boehner resigned as the hard right wing threatened years ago to recall him as Speaker. So, Mosh, we're now going on more than two weeks without a Speaker. It is a position of power that is second in line to the presidency. Of course, Kevin McCarthy was ousted by a member of his own party a couple of weeks ago. What is next here? Really, right now, um, as we speak, all the cards are being held by Jim Jordan. So any moment, any minute, any hour, any day here, he could decide, listen, I'm going to hang it up. I'm not going to get the votes. And that's when um, you'll see other people jump in here. So far, they're being respectful um, of him, giving him his shot. But it does not appear like the Jim Jordan Speaker of the House dream will become a reality. Remember, he's the founding member of the Hard Right Freedom Caucus. Um, he's burnt some bridges within the party. Uh, he's never passed a piece of legislation in more than 10 years in Congress, and that's a knock on him as well, that he's more about media interviews and um, incendiary language than actually getting things done. So he has moderates um, who are critical of him as being too far right, but as some conservatives who feel burned by him as well. So it's a diverse but small and slightly growing group here that uh, are over Jordan. They don't want to see him. He's trying late Wednesday uh, to uh, make some deals, um, including with New York moderate Republicans, seeing what he can give them potentially here. Um, the alternative here, given that we're more than two weeks in and they can't come to a consensus candidate so far, is uh, the temporary speaker. Patrick McHenry uh, from North Carolina, you might know him as the guy's the bow tie. Uh, he's running things, not really empowered to do much as the temporary speaker. Um, it's actually a position that's only existed for 20 years. Nobody really knows what it could do. They can make their own rules on Capitol Hill. Um, so some people are saying, listen, let's just give him more power. We have a government shutdown we're facing in just about four weeks. Let's give him some power while we get our act together. Republican Party. At the same time, Republicans are trying to blame the whole thing on Democrats. Kevin McCarthy was doing interviews, actually got into it with a Fox News reporter who was like, come on, what's going on with your pardon? He's like, well, this is Democrats causing our troubles. And even the Fox reporter was like, come on, Kevin, this is like a problem within Republicans. When are you guys going to get your act together? Mosh, we know McHenry loves the gavel, so oh. <laughs> I'm sure he's excited. <laughs> Posting a video on the Monu's Instagram account of every gavel he's done so far. It's this huge <laughs> gavel the speaker gets to hold every time he brings in the session, brings out the session, and he slams that thing. I don't know what, what it's about. We need to ask him about it. Like, what's Is it anger? What is it about? Maybe it's that he knows that it's a really short-lived position. So yeah. he's just trying just to make the, most, the of most of each, yeah, make the most <laughs> of each gavel. All right, time now for the speed read from CNN. Almost two decades after Natalie Holloway vanished in Aruba, the man long suspected in her death has confessed to killing the Alabama teen in grisly detail. This is according to court documents. You might remember this case from back in 2005. Jorn Vandersloot's confession was publicized shortly after he pleaded guilty in federal court Wednesday to extorting and defrauding the Holloway family. He was accused of trying to sell information about the location of Holloway's remains to her mother, Beth Holloway, in exchange for $250,000. She has since said, quote, it is over. Jorn Vandersloot is no longer the suspect in my daughter's murder. He is the killer. After 18 years, Natalie's case is solved. He gave a proffer in which he finally confessed to killing Natalie in a proffer. By the way, a defendant offers information that they know about a crime, often as part of a plea deal. So this is a case that I was working at Fox News um, in 2005, 2006, 2007, I actually went to Aruba um, for Fox um, as we covered this, but, you know, what we thought was a mystery. Vandersloot was always a suspect, uh, but they couldn't quite pin it on him. Uh, and it's pretty remarkable that it's taken 18 years. Kind of reminds me of the Tupac case um, in Vegas that we've been reporting on recently. It's also that searches back to the 90s that you kind of knew who did it. Um, in fact, they sort of admitted it at times, and now it's actually becoming official 
finally. The details here, though, are pretty graphic um, here as far as the murder. What van der Sloot admits uh, to doing, he's, by the way, now 36 years old, uh, just a teen back then. He admits to killing Natalie with a cinder block on an Aruba beach after she rejected his sexual advances. That's according to a transcript of an interview with his attorney. Van der Sloot said that Holloway kneed him in the crotch after he made a move. He responded by kicking her and then bludgeoning her with a cinder block. He then decided to push her off into the ocean, according to the interview. He's actually currently serving a separate 28-year prison sentence in Peru for a separate murder in 2010 of a woman of a woman named Stephanie Flores. Peruvian officials, though, allowed his temporary release to the U.S. Um, to face these new charges. The gruesome deaths of Holloway and that Peruvian woman prompted the judge to sentence Van der Sloot to 28 years on federal charges. Van der Sloot has been arrested multiple times in connection with Holloway's death. He was then released by Aruban authorities. This is very controversial at the time, who cited at the time a lack of evidence. Now, of course, they have an admission. Moshe, I covered this when I was working at the news desk for NBC back in 2005. Uh, if you remember Holloway, she was visiting Aruba on a high school graduation trip when she vanished. She was 18 years old, last seen leaving a nightclub with Vandersloot and two other men. The three were arrested in 2005, but they were released because of insufficient evidence. I'm glad there's finally some, you know, resolution here, some justice. For the Holloway family. From Axios, years after it first broached delivering drugs by drone, Amazon is poised to launch a service in College Station, Texas, that it says will airlift certain common medicines to homes that are within 60 minutes. It is the latest move by the online retailer to disrupt healthcare delivery and a convenience that could help patients start treatments faster and adhere to prescriptions. Amazon has been testing out 30-minute drone delivery for other products as part of its Prime Air service, which launched in June of 2022. The company saying that the College Station pilot will allow residents to pick and choose from 500 drugs delivered for free by drone, including treatments for common conditions like the flu, asthma, and pneumonia. The director of product at Prime Air saying that medicines were the first thing that customers said that they wanted delivered quickly via drone most which you can really understand because the last thing that you want to do when you're sick is go to the pharmacy to pick up your prescription or, or yeah. just even over the over the counter medicine well especially in the covid post covid era I, i'm now like acutely aware every time i walk into a walgreens or cvs i'm like how many people in here are sick right now <laughs> this like might not be the place to pick up a snack or band-aids right now um <laughs> So Amazon Pharmacy here is entering an increasingly crowded space. In 2019, UPS became the first company in the U.S. to receive FAA approval to operate commercial drones. Uh, they began testing their use with CVS, with Kaiser Permanente. Walmart has started to roll out grocery delivery by drone in a limited number of regions. This seems to start to become a real thing here. Zipline. Uh, Wing, which is owned by uh, Google parent Alphabet, um, are preparing for wide-scale U.S. deployment starting in the next year. Again, they're currently available in a handful of markets. Um, but Jill, very soon, you know, if you're you know living in suburbia, you might your view might just be a lot of drones um, delivering packages. I can't tell if this is going to be a good thing <laughs> or frightening. <laughs> I think the birds are going to be confused. I think there's a, just got to look up. Just always be looking <laughs> up. From Bloomberg, Americans experienced a record surge in net worth in the last few years. According to a new report, it was propelled by unprecedented government stimulus during the pandemic, laying the groundwork for this economic resilience that we're still seeing even in 2023. The median net worth jumped by more than a third to $192,000 to $192,900 from 2019 to 2022. This is according to the Fed's Survey of Consumer Finances, and this marks the largest three-year increase in data back to 1989, and it was more than double the next largest one on record. The data paired with this really tight job market that we're still seeing underscore the strong backdrop that has supported the economy this year. Most remember, we've been on this recession watch for more than a year at this point. We've sort of stopped with it because it was like, okay, it's not happening. But it was a big theme a few months ago. 
Yeah, and I think there are some economists that still think that uh, we've postponed the recession into 2024, but it's still coming, you know, so you're hearing those warnings. Uh, as far as this net worth increase, sounds like a good headline, right? Americans are accumulating wealth. Um, a lot of this, though, has to do with the home values. If you own a home, uh, the value there has skyrocketed. So that's your net worth. Uh, more people have been investing in the stock market. So that's helped. So you're not necessarily liquid immediately with this net worth. Um, at the same time, though, even if you're liquid with it, prices have gone up, right? It's one of the reasons people have more money, they have more savings, they have more value in their house. Uh, at the same time, prices have gone up. So you're not necessarily feeling it as much. Um, consumer spending has not yet buckled. Uh, Americans have more excess savings than previously thought. We also are seeing some credit card debt um, go up higher. So you see all these economic numbers, some kind of counteract each other, um, but still interesting. And it does come as the Fed here, as we've been saying, for more than a year on this podcast, is trying to bring inflation down, trying to tame price increases. But with people with money, that means that prices keep going up because people keep spending money. So um, as the Fed fights this, they're looking to raise interest rates again. We expect one more hike this year. Then uh, the prediction right now is they'll start to bring down interest rates in the back half of next year. That's something we can watch for. As far as the age breakdown here, just want to note this. This is interesting. Median net worth rose for all age groups with the largest growth among families younger than 35 who saw their median net worth more than double interesting uh, but they remain even with this net worth jump the least wealthy age group while americans 65 to 74 had the largest coffers you know you hear these arguments all the time on social media gen z and millennials complaining about how the boomers had it easy they could have actual wage growth they were able to afford things but the boomers are telling the young people if you just save and work hard you'll be able to achieve what we can we achieved and everyone young is like no 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 the world has changed Okay, when I on. was your age, I used to walk two miles in the snow. <laughs> and it all worked out. And it was like, when, I was, when you were my age, you could buy a house for a hundred grand. And it was great. <laughs> From the New York Times, United Airlines plans to speed up its boarding process by having passengers in economy class who have purchased window seats get on the plane before people in the middle and aisle seats. This change is set to take effect next week. It could cut up to two minutes from boarding time on each flight, according to an internal memo that was shared with the New York Times. It will affect domestic flights and some international ones. Airlines, which have recovered from a drop in travel during the pandemic, regularly tinker with boarding processes to try and save time and boost money. Under United's new seating plan, it's known as WILMA, a loose acronym for window, middle, aisle. People in economy class with window seats will board first, followed by people in middle seats. And then those in the aisle and families traveling on the same flight will get to board together. So you're not going to have to say like, Olivia, you're on it. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> right. They will include groups there, by the way, if you have status or your business class, you still get to go first. Um, it is interesting that like we're living in the year 2023 and they're still trying out new boarding mechanisms here. Apparently United uh, tested this a few years ago at five airports and found it effective at reducing boarding times. And there is some thought to taking this further and dividing people into the back half and front half of the plane and basically beginning with the, you know, uh, windows in the back and then heading towards the front um, to be more efficient. And while two minutes per flight doesn't sound like a lot, given the number of flights uh, this could save millions of dollars going to experts um, if they're actually able to implement this um, widely. And it also saves people from just that awkwardness of like, sorry, can you move it? You know, making people who are on that aisle who are already seated get yeah. up if you have to climb or you have to climb over them to get to the window seat. Not, yeah. And the, and the person in the aisle has already brought out their takeout food. And it's already like, <laughs> They're comfortable. It's like a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> You make a very good point, though. How have airlines not cracked the code yet on how on how quickly? There's got to be, right? There's yeah. got to be a code, and they're still figuring it out. Okay, Moshe, you wanted cheery on yesterday's podcast, so I found a holiday shopping story from us. This from USA Today. It is never too early to start prepping for the holiday season, and this year, Martha Stewart, the master of home entertainment, is helping shoppers out with a special curated collection from Etsy. All gifts will cost less than 50 bucks. There are also some essentials for the consummate holiday party host. She says she loves to look for unusual gifts, and that's what Etsy is perfect for. And she also says a cardinal mistake for gift givers is that they give too many of the same things. So she says she likes to personalize what she is giving people. She tries to make each gift a bit more unique and thoughtful. 
That's the same Martha Stewart who was on the cover of Sports Illustrated in a swimsuit recently, right? At the age of 82. She's the one. Martha still at it. <laughs> um, pretty remarkable. She was actually hired recently by Etsy as one of the first kind of cu content curators. Um, so uh, they are, you know, rolling her out here. They've apparently already released uh, what's in for this holiday season in their holiday trends guide. The guide steers shoppers to six different vibes anointed with TikTok titles, including mantlescaping, candy core, and grandpa chic. <laughs> what does that mean? Like cardigans and New Balance sneakers? Like what, what does that even mean? I don't know. Uh, both your your father and mine are both grandpas, so we're gonna see you know <laughs> if they're into grandpa chic from uh, from Etsy. Um, Stewart's collection leans towards what they call elevated entertaining vibe, including unusual handmade decorations and cutting boards, perfect for displaying cheese and fruit for guests. Martha, man, still doing her thing. Post prison time, post collaborations with Snoop Dogg. Good for her. All right, now time for On This Day in History. We're going to begin in 1796. And as I said at the beginning of this podcast, we thought politics was nasty. You, If you think politics is nasty now, go back to the 1790s. Back then, in the Gazette of the United States, a mysterious writer named Fusion attacks presidential candidate Thomas Jefferson. Now, this was the first competitive election after George Washington serves his two terms. He says to step down. This is the election between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Well, a man named Fosion, or he went by Fosion, it was actually Alexander Hamilton, uh, was writing essays against Thomas Jefferson, hated him, his nemesis, um, including essays accusing Jefferson of carrying on an affair with one of his slaves, who at the time was unnamed. The woman at the center of these charges turned out to be Sally Hemings. She actually, by the way, may have been the half-sister of Jefferson's late wife, Martha, but he was dropping um, rhetorical bombs on Jefferson in that election. Uh, of course, Adams would go on to win that election. Jefferson would then win four years later, uh, but that's when Jefferson would return the favor against Hamilton. Six years later, a Jefferson supporter was exposing Hamilton's affair with a colleague's wife. If you've seen the musical or you know the musical, you might be familiar with the storyline, but it's a uh, fascinating little uh, glimpse into literally the first competitive election and dropping, you know, that this guy's having an affair. Um, we were doing that not in the 1990s. Well, we were doing that in the 1990s, but we were also doing that in the 1790s. So does this make us feel better or worse about American <laughs> politics? <laughs> We've always been this bad. Is that is that the takeaway? Politics <laughs> everywhere has always been bad, Jill. Everyone's like, you, you know, you get down like Mosh, our politics. And I was like, do you know what Congress was up to back in the day? Like Aaron Burr, to continue the storyline, right? The sitting vice president then shoots Hamilton and kills him. Like the vice president killed a man. In the eighteen in the early eighteen hundreds, um, so like we had a lot of crazy things happening in early American politics. So, not to say we can't be better, but just saying we haven't always been great. There weren't the glory days. We try to remember the glory days. There had never really been glory days, Jill. All right, we're going to fast forward to the 20th century. On this day, October 19th, 1985, the first Blockbuster video rental store opened in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Blockbuster, uh, an iconic place for many of us in the 80s and 90s until Netflix took it down. Interestingly, Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix at a very, very cheap price. And Blockbuster was like, we don't need you guys. Netflix was like, okay. And then they ate their lunch and dinner and all the meals. And the irony, of course, as we reported earlier this week, that now Netflix is thinking of opening brick and mortar locations. Good for them. <laughs> Will Netflix house hold a candle to Blockbuster? We'll see. Never, never. There was like a smell to Blockbuster like that, that melted plastic. Um, that was like, there's just... It was great. Um, we're going to stick in the 80s here for one more item. On this day in 1987, the Dow dropped 23% in one day, a day that became known as Black Monday. Um, so a bit of business history there. And on this day in 2005, the Iraqi Special Tribunal that started the trial into Saddam Hussein for crimes against humanity. Saddam had been the leader um, of Iraq. When the U.S. goes in there, invades, engages in regime change, he escapes. The U.S. eventually finds it. Uh, Saddam would eventually be found guilty, executed in late 2006. Um, fun anecdote, you might remember this from a podcast we did last year with former CIA director Mike Morell. Uh, Saddam grew a beard for the trial. Some suspected that he grew a beard because the judge was uh, very Islamic, was religious, and they thought he was trying to curry favor with the judge. 
Mike Morell tells the story, having been in the intelligence community, that they actually discovered that Saddam grew a beard because one of the prison guards told him that American women dig beards, and he was being treated by American nurses who were checking on his condition, and apparently he was trying to win over the American nurses, reinforcing the age-old lesson, it's always for a woman. It, oh, always. <laughs> That's unbelievable. All right, we're going to end here with a bit of pop culture. On this day in 1985, take on, on me. me. I shouldn't be singing on a normal day, <laughs> let alone when my voice sounds like this. Um, Norway's AHA put out the song Take On Me. Uh, the music video helped it reach the top of the U.S. pop charts. You might remember this music video. Back in the day, kids, we used to watch music videos on MTV. It was a comic book style video where like the people were popping out of the book innovative for the time one of my favorite 80s songs it's great great beat aha what happened to them all right speaking of another musical act that put out really sticky music uh fat boy slim remember them from the 90s on this day in 1998 25 years ago they released their you've come a long way baby album that included praise you we've come a long long way together through the hard times and the good. I have to praise you like I should. Oh, yeah, yeah. Praise you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mosh. <laughs> no problem. I'm, I'm here to remind you uh, of those like little musical things that have been like stored away in your brain for a very long time. And you know that this will now be stuck in everybody's head for the rest of the day. Take me <laughs> on. <laughs> I'd rather that one. Okay. Okay, everybody. Well, that is a wrap of our NPR style podcast. We want to thank you for listening to the Mo News podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and review us in the App Store. Where else will you get the latest on the Middle East, the Speaker of the House race, um, how they're going to seat you on the United Airlines, a little history Wilma. of uh, AHA, <laughs> Fat Boy Slim, and Thomas Jefferson versus, I, I swear to you, you will not find another place that gave you these news stories today. We've got range. All right, everybody. See you tomorrow.